We now come to the urgent question. Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. To ask the Chancellor of the Exchequer to make a statement on the IMF outlook. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This Government has three economic priorities. Our plan for this year is to halve inflation, grow the economy and get debt falling. It is a plan that will alleviate the pressure on businesses and families today and equip us to become one of the most prosperous countries in Europe. As the IMF said in its press conference today, we think that the UK is on the right track. It also said that the UK had done well in last year, with growth revised upwards to 4.1 per cent, one of the highest growth rates in Europe uh, for 2022. Since 2010, the UK has grown faster than France, Japan and Italy, and since the EU referendum, we have grown at about the same rate as Germany. Cumulative growth over the 2022-24 period is predicted to be higher than Germany and Japan and at a similar rate to the United States of America. And the, government of the, the Governor of the Bank of England has said that any UK recession this year is likely to be shallower than previously predicted. The actions we are taking, from unleashing innovation across AI, financial services and a host of other sectors, to improving technical education and protecting infrastructure investment, will spur and fuel economic growth in the years to come, benefiting industry and communities alike. However, Mr Speaker, the figures from the IMF do confirm that we are not immune to the pressures hitting nearly all advanced economies. We agree with the IMS focus on the high level of inflation in our country, which is why it is our top priority. Inflation is the most insidious tax rise there is, and so the best tax, a tax cut now is to reduce inflation. It will help families across the country with the cost of living. As the Chancellor has said, short-term challenges, especially ones we are focused on tackling, should not obscure our long-term forecasts. If we stick to our plan to halve inflation, the UK is still predicted to grow faster than Germany and Japan over the coming years. That will help us deliver a stronger economy, one that is growing faster and where everywhere across our country people have opportunities for better paying good jobs. That is what people in this country expect and what we are working tirelessly to deliver. Yeah. Rachel Reeves, yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, Britain has huge potential, but 13 years of Tory failure has been a drag anchor on our prosperity. Today's IMF assessment holds a mirror up to the wasted opportunities, and it is not a pretty sight. The UK is the only major economy forecast to shrink this year. Weaker growth compared to our competitors for both of the next two years. The world upgraded, Britain downgraded. Growth even worse than sanctions hit Russia. The IMF chief economist singles out higher mortgage rates as a reason for Britain's poor performance. The Tory mortgage penalty is devastating family finances and holding back our economy. And British businesses are paying the price for the gaping holes in the Tories' Brexit deal. It will fall to Labour to clean up this mess. Now, if the Chancellor had ideas, answers or courage, he would be here today. But he is not. The question that the people of our country are now asking is this. Are me and my family better off after 13 years of Conservative government? The answer is no. And as the IMF showed today, it doesn't have to be this way. Now, I'm sure the Minister will clutch at straws and say everything is fine or the IMF forecasts are just wrong. But can he explain why the UK is still the only G7 economy that is smaller now than it was before the pandemic? Why is the UK the only G7 economy with its growth forecast downgraded this year? Why are we at the bottom of the league table both this year and next year too? And can the Minister answer this? Why should anyone trust the Conservatives with the economy ever again? Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Lady uh, you know, grateful for her questions, but she talks about 13 years of failure. Let me just repeat the actual facts of the matter. Since 2010, the UK has grown faster than France, Japan and Italy. 
The Honourable the Shadow Chancellor talks about the next two years. As I said, uh, the forecast is from the IMF is that cumulative growth, growth over the 22-24 period is predicted to be higher in, in the UK than Germany and Japan, and at a similar rate to the US. I am actually grateful that the Shadow Chancellor is quoting the IMF because I'm going to quote the IMF too. Let's go to the press conference at about 3 a.m. this morning, Mr. Speaker, which I'm sure you were eagerly watching. <laughs> and quote their economic counsellor, Pierre-Olivier Gorinchas, who said, let's start with the good news. The UK economy has actually done relatively well in the last year. We've revised growth upwards to 4.1%. That's one of the highest growth rates in Europe in that region for that year, 2022. That's from the IMF press conference this morning, Mr Speaker. But the crucial, the crucial point is this, the Shadow Chancellor did actually give a very passing reference to the pandemic. Usually it's their habit to completely airbrush out of history the fact that we as a government have overseen two of the greatest challenges in our history as a country, a pandemic followed by the invasion of Ukraine. Well, I know why the Shadow Chancellor doesn't want to talk about the pandemic, because let's just remember, back in December 2021, when the Welsh administration uh, the Labour Welsh administration wanted to lock down in the face of Omicron. We took the brave decision as a, as, as a government not to lock down in England. And if we'd have, if we'd have taken their advice, let's remember what the Shadow, Health, uh, sorry, the Shadow Health Secretary said at the time. He said, we believe that Plan B is insufficient. There are additional measures that are necessary. They would have kept us locked down for longer. We took the decision to keep our country open, and that's particularly because of the vaccine, which we brought forward, which they would not have done so. But I just want to make this final point, Mr Speaker. I've said the crucial point is inflation. It's bearing down on, on inflation, which gives us the best chance of restoring sustainable growth. And a key facet of dealing with inflation is fiscal discipline. Now, we've heard from the Shadow Chancellor recently that Labour is suddenly the party of sound money. Well, since, since the speech, I think it was two weeks ago, in which the leader of the Labour Party promised to put away the great big government checkbook, they've made £45 billion of unfunded spending commitments. So we all know where that ends. They start writing blank cheques. It ends with a letter from their Chief Secretary to the rest of the country saying there's no money left. Chair of the Select Committee, Harriet Baldwin. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And uh, will the Minister take this opportunity to reflect on last year when, despite the headwinds of uh, the coronavirus, uh, an invasion of Ukraine, huge hikes in energy costs, rising interest rates, high inflation in this country, the UK's businesses managed to generate over 4.1% of economic growth, twice the economic growth of the United States, 25% higher than uh, economic growth in China and higher than the Eurozone. Here, here. Well, the Chair of the Select Committee is spot on. Instead of talking down our economy, yeah. Mr Speaker, she is making the key point that despite all of those challenges, we had strong growth last year, and the reason is because of British enterprise. And that's why on Friday, the Chancellor, himself a former entrepreneur, I don't think there's many on the opposite benches, that's why we're going to back advanced manufacturing and the high growth sectors to ensure we continue to deliver that level of growth in future. SNP spokesperson Stuart Hosey. Thank you, yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker. I suppose it's opposite. There's an urgent question on a potential recession on the third anniversary of Brexit. Yeah. Uh, the IMF have said that the UK economy would face a downgrade, <laughs> the only G7 country to be facing recession, reflecting, they say, tighter fiscal and monetary policies and the still high energy retail prices weighing on household budget. Yeah. And there's no getting away from it. Uh, with even sanctioned Russia forecast to grow, this is a gloomy prognosis. But given the government they only expect to meet their own new fiscal rule on public sector net debt by a paltry £9 billion in 2027 28 according to the OBR, there is also no fiscal headroom uh, to provide more support because of the government's own strictures. So is this not the time to reduce the energy company's investment allowance, mm -hmm. which allows them to reduce the tax they pay by 91 pence in the pound <coughs> to start to ge generate a meaningful windfall tax yep. required to both further support the economy and households and SMEs who will otherwise see their energy costs rocket this year 
two of the main drivers of the IMS, IMF forecast. Here, here. Well, I'll say to the honourable gentleman, he talks about tight fiscal monetary policy. Of course, we are faced with inflation. It's, it's higher in the UK than in, uh, in 14 countries in the EU. Mr. Speaker, this is a global challenge with inflation. So he's right, we do need to have that stance. Obviously, we want to get inflation down. But I would just point out, he talks about the cost of energy bills. That's precisely why this winter a typical household in the United Kingdom will have received £1,300 of support, £1,400 in cost of living payments, and the energy price guarantee estimated by the OBR to be worth £900 for the typical household. That's support provided to every single part of the United Kingdom. But on his specific suggestion, and to be fair, he's making a, a specific fiscal proposal in relation to the allowance. What I would say is that that's going to hurt one particular sector. It's going to hurt the North Sea. It's going to hurt investment in UK energy. And do you know what the long-term answer to, the, to this is? It's not support in families. We're doing that very generously at the moment. The long-term answer is energy security, investing in nuclear and investing in the North Sea as part of our transition to net zero. Sir Edward Lee. If the Minister is not able to share with the House the advice he has received from the Opposition on how they are going to reduce public spending and taxation if they ever form a government, will he at least accept my advice that the message from successful enterprise economies is we must have a credible plan to reduce corporation tax and regulation on business? Well, Great respect for my honourable friend, who is very consistent on these points. Uh, I'm bound to point out that ev even with the forecast increases, uh, corporation tax will still be the lowest in the G7 headline rates. And of course, uh, roughly 70% of businesses don't pay that higher rate because of the uh, small business rate that pertains. I, I haven't received any representations from the party opposite, I can say to him, other than uh, a pledge for sound money from a party which, since promising to put away the great big government checkbook, has announced almost £50 billion of unfunded spending commitments. Dave, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Despite the Minister's bluster, the benches opposite are empty. They haven't come in in large numbers to defend the government's economic, uh, economic uh, uh, res results, have they? And that is because the IMF uh, is a devastating forecast which lays bare the economic incompetence of this government, only sanctioned Russia. Sanctioned Russia is still doing better than we are. This government is unfit to run the economy, as unfit as the Treasury bench is to be in the Treasury. Well, I'm pleased to say there is very colourful support on our back benches. Um, and I'm sure there will be further pertinent and brilliant questions to come. And I just say to the Honourable Lady, she quotes the IMF, I simply reiterate what their economic council has said this morning uh, about the UK. He said, let's start with the good news. The UK economy has actually done relatively well in the last year. We've revised growth upwards to 4.1%. That's one of the highest growth rates in Europe. That's exactly what the IMF said. So Desmond Swain. Yeah. What should the IMF make of our burgeoning 65 billion trade surplus in financial services? <laughs> Well, I think, Mr. Speaker, the IMF always stressed the importance of sustainable growth. It's sustainable growth that matters, and of course, my friend's absolutely right. Exports are crucial to that. The, the city and financial services is a massive UK success story. We want to build on that. That's why we've announced the Edinburgh reforms and further measures to strengthen UK financial services. We're quite clear: the future for this country is optimistic, and we, we get there by backing brilliant British business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <laughs> the Minister talks about COVID, the pandemic, as if it's the only, this is the only country that experienced the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. The Minister talks about the Ukraine crisis as if the fuel costs are only affecting this country, yeah. but he fails to mention that the former Prime Minister and her Chancellor crashed the economy yeah. on, to yeah. on top of the uncertainties of the previous years following the failure to get a decent deal after Brexit, which has hit our economy with a 4% hit on output, £55 billion of fiscal consolidation because of the failure of his government. When is, going to, when is he going to admit to that and face up to the reality in terms instead of misleading the British people? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the total contrary, I think the, the whole point of why we mentioned the pandemic in Ukraine is not to say that we're the only country affected. On the contrary, it's to explain that these are global headwinds that we face as a country. 
And, uh, and, and the Honourable Lady talks about energy costs. To be absolutely clear, the OBR's forecast in relation to the energy price guarantee is that it will reduce the peak of inflation in this country by 2.5%. Inflation is an issue, it is global, but we are taking strong measures in this country to ensure we deliver the Prime Minister's uh, target of halving inflation. Uh, isn't it uh, right that the IMF actually welcomed the autumn statement and said that it struck the right balance between fiscal responsibility, protecting growth and vulnerable households? And given what we've heard that the IMF have also said cumulative UK growth over 2022-24 will is predicted to be higher than Germany and Japan, similar to the USA, isn't this exactly why we should stick to the measures set out in that autumn statement? Well, my honourable friend makes a brilliant point. She reminds us not only did the IMF this morning talk about our strong performance in 2022, of course, at the autumn statement, they welcomed those measures. They recognised there had to be a balance struck between fiscal consolidation, but as she says, doing it in a way that supports the most vulnerable. And the best example of that I can give is that from April, far from withdrawing support with high energy costs, there will be a new 900 payment for families on benefits, and it shows we are getting the balance right between the fiscal discipline necessary to ensure we work the Bank of England to reduce inflation, but ensuring families are supported through these challenging times. Emma Harvey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today, the Government's response to the IMF forecast has been to simply say that the forecast is wrong. So if the Government won't look at the forecast, let's look at the facts. The UK is the only G7 economy smaller now than it was at the start of the pandemic. And growth has been lower under the Conservatives than it was under the last Labour government. So can the Minister tell us whether the government has any respect for our international economic institutions? Minister. I didn't question the IMF forecast. That is not correct. I simply quoted what they said, which is that cumulative growth over the 2022-24 period is predicted to be higher than Germany and Japan, and at a similar rate to the US. But Indeed, Mr. Speaker, I remind the, the Minister and the Right Honourable Lady opposite that forecasts are just that. They are subject to substantial revision. I remember in 2012, when the IMF downgraded the forecast, only substantially to upgrade it the following year. The key thing is to have a long-term approach. Uh, so will the Minister confirm that the Government will build on the Prime Minister's May's lecture uh, and the Chancellor's excellent speech uh, on Friday and complement that with a clear industrial strategy so that investors can have a clear view of the government's business policy as countries like the US, Japan and South Korea are doing. Yeah. Well, my right on friend obviously speaks with great expertise both as a former Secretary of State and Select Committee uh, Chair. Um, he's absolutely right. Whatever forecasts say, we have got a clear strategy for long-term sustainable growth in this country. It comes from supporting high growth sectors. And in particular, and I'm glad he mentioned the speech on Friday, um, the Chancellor he, uh, spoke about uh, the fact that we are only the third economy in the world with a trillion dollar tech sector. I know the Shadow Chancellor doesn't like this fact. We are only the third economy in the world with a trillion dollar tech sector. We should be proud of that. But of course, we want to build on it further. That's how we deliver strong, sustainable growth in every part of the United Kingdom. Sir Olney. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The UK economy has faced a triple whammy in recent days. The IMF forecast saying that the UK is the only major economy which will slide into recession this year, an ONS survey setting out the true horror of this winter of discontent, and insolvency figures out today showing more companies going bust than at any point since the 2009 crisis. Can the Minister tell me when and where will the Brexit benefits begin? Minister. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady, as ever. Of course, she misses out the fact that we have the lowest unemployment for the best part of 50 years. We should all be very proud of that. We know the scars that are caused by high unemployment. We know that in the pandemic, when it started, unemployment was predicted to finish two million higher than it ended up because of the measures taken by this government, by the Prime Minister when he was Chancellor, furlough and so on. And we're going to continue supporting households. She talks about the winter of discontent. I, as I said, £1,300 of support for a typical family this winter with their energy bills. That shows we're on their side, but we need to go further. And we do that by delivering on the target to halve inflation. The Right Honourable Lady opposite mentions that our growth rate is not as great as Russia. What she doesn't mention, Mr Speaker, is that the IMF said that of Germany too, because both Germany and the United Kingdom are dependent on gas. 
But my question to my right honourable friend is how many times over the last 10 years has the IMF had to revise their economic forecast? If he doesn't know the answer, would he please write to me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be a pleasure as ever to write to my honourable friend. But I would just point out on the he mentioned about dependent on gas. Last year, we should be very proud of the fact that over 40% of our electricity was generated from renewables, just 1.5% from coal. We ha we've had the fastest falling emissions in the G7. And as a, a, a recent report confirmed in The Times, we can get those lower emissions with higher growth. And they said that jobs in the net zero sectors paid £10,000 more than the national average. The Times reported in particular that South Yorkshire, North Derbyshire, Tyneside and Teesside are all hotspots for net zero jobs. And it shows that we can deliver on net zero and deliver economic growth. Thank you very much. Mr Speaker, does the Minister think Tory austerity, Tory Brexit or the Tory trust budget is responsible for the unique mess of our economies in? Or is it all of the above? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, as I said, it's very far from a unique mess when 14 EU countries have a higher rate of inflation than we do. That's why we're focused on inflation. And just to be clear, that will take some difficult decisions. And I think it would help in that regard if members opposite, instead of living in a parallel universe where their leadership and their shadow chancellor talk about sound money, but not a single one of them ever do, or even venture to understand it, they need to start showing what difficult decisions they would actually take, because that's how you run the country. Blake Drummond. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And getting the economy moving forward more quickly will depend on supporting investment and research and development. Will my honourable friend look at ensuring that uh, R&D continues to be incentivised as a means to boosting our growth? Well, my honourable friend makes an excellent point. She's absolutely right. I spoke about high growth sectors. Of course, in those sectors, one of the ways they drive up sustainable growth is through R&D. It's incredibly important. We are, on, we are on track to spend, as a government, in terms of public expenditure, £20 billion by 2024-25, but also committed to uh, a competitive regime on R&D tax credits to ensure the private sector does their side and ensures that we have, as far as possible, the highest level of R&D we can and ensures that we can deliver investment and research into the industries of the future. Carla Lockhart. Speaker, uh, the forecast is concerning for every corner of the United Kingdom. However, in Northern Ireland, uh, there's an added uncertainty owing to the protocol and the internal barriers to trade at places within the United yeah, Kingdom. Yeah. Investment to drive growth is now being stalled and we, as we await a new agreement. Does the government recognise the need to urgently restore the integrity of the United Kingdom's internal market to assist economic growth in Northern Ireland, and does he commit to doing that? Yeah, yeah. Well, the Honourable Lady makes an excellent point. We must deliver growth in every part of the United Kingdom. She knows the works that is happening across departments in terms of the protocol, um, uh, but I, I would just make the general point. I have mentioned energy support before. She knows there are specific uh, conditions that pertain in terms of the Northern Ireland energy market, but we have still put huge support in place, including the recent £600 payment, which shows, as I said earlier, we are on the side of families, and that absolutely Absolutely includes every part of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Scott Benton. I'm pleased that the Minister is focusing on the facts rather than the forecasts, which have been proven time and time again to be incorrect. And the facts of the matter are that, according to the IMF, last year we had the highest rates of growth of any nation in the G7, nearly double that of the US and higher that of the whole Eurozone. A pretty good record, wouldn't you agree? Well, my old friend is an absolute champion. He talks up this country because he's right. The facts back that up. It shows we should be optimistic. Of course there are challenges. There are challenges. And we want to get on top of those challenges, which is why we have to work hard to support our independent Bank of England in getting inflation down. But like him, I'm optimistic that if we do that, we can see the sort of growth we had last year. And actually, that's what the IMF shows. Their cumulative forecast is that over 2022-24, we are predicted to have higher growth in Germany and Japan and at a similar rate to the US. Stella Cruz. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister seems to be walking away from the question about what role Brexit has played in this economic outlook, and I can understand why, because over half of his own constituents think it was a mistake. These benefits of Brexit seem to be like a toddler's imaginary friend. Ministers keep talking about them, but only they can see them. The Prime Minister's spokesman today told us that we are now seeing significant benefits from Brexit. So will the Minister set the record straight? Can he explain to the small businesses in our constituencies who used to be able to export with ease to the European Union 
a single market where they now face a better deal than they did before. Minister. Well, I'm, I'm happy to stress, for example, the hugely important solvency uh, two reforms will be undertaken, which will free up enormous amounts of investment in infrastructure, because, of course, infrastructure is so crucial to future growth. Um, I'm pleased to say, as a minister responsible for alcohol duty, we'll have reform in August, which means we can have differential duty between pubs and supermarkets, only possible because of Brexit. But I think the most important, by far, was when we were faced with the greatest challenge outside of wartime in this country, in the pandemic. This country was able to move fast with an amazing vaccine programme because of its independence, which reduced deaths and freed up our economy and allowed us to reopen and get growing again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Williams. Speaker, today the Bloomberg UK scored card reports that relative to London, life has got worse in areas that voted to leave the EU. This includes and this one where the Two Sisters factory has announced that it is closing in March, with 730 people losing their jobs, many of them from my Arvon constituency. Now, there's no point the Minister blustering about excuses around Covid and about Russia. The company says plainly Brexit is partly yeah, to blame. Yeah. So, no excuses, no apologies. What's he doing about it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm obviously sorry to hear that. I don't know the specific circumstances. Obviously, we want to see strong investment and growth into this country, particularly in manufacturing. Um, I can tell him, as he's aware, unemployment is about the lowest it's been for decades in this country. We're very proud of that fact. But obviously, where there are challenges, we want to look at them. And if he wants to write to me with the details of the case, I'll happily look into it. Mr. Speaker. Isn't it time the Minister tells the truth to my constituents? Isn't the truth that not only have they hollowed out our defence capacity, this government has hollowed out our economy? And will you also explain to my constituents why they've sent the cabin boy, you know, the ship of shame over there, no crew there, no captain, no first mate, and they send the, captain, the captain's cabin boy to answer questions on this most vital question of the moment. I mean, can, I, can, I, can I just say, he's an elder statesman of this house. I'm sure he could be pleasant if he really tried to. So I don't think it does this chamber any good with that kind of question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. But if he wants to raise defence, I mean, he might want to explain to his constituents why at the last general election he backed the right on gentleman who was sitting up there earlier uh, the, the, the MP for Islington North, whose policy would have had us leaving NATO, undermine the nuclear deterrent, whereas in reality what we've done is to stand by the U people of Ukraine in the face of a real war. We haven't deployed into the theatre, but we've done everything possible short of that. We've been training the Ukrainian army since 2015. So yes, I'll tell his constituents the truth. The truth is they should be proud of what this country is doing for the people of Ukraine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mr Speaker. I wonder if the minister thinks that the sanctions against Russia are having the desired effect. And, and if he thinks that they do, as I suspect he does, can he explain why the IMF is predicting that Russia will fare much better than us? Yeah. Well, I'm happy once again to refer to what the IMF said. As I said, at this morning's press conference, Pierre-Olivier Gorinchas, their economic counsellor, confirmed the good news. The UK economy has actually done relatively well in the last year. We've revised growth upwards to 4.1 per cent. That's one of the highest growth rates in Europe. Yeah. Listen to this. You, Mr. Speaker, he talks about other countries, but the reason that things are so bad in the UK is squarely down to the impact that Brexit yeah, is having yeah. on the economy, a Brexit that Scotland did not vote for. So can you tell me how piling austerity on austerity that has already taken place over the past decade, how is that actually going to help us out of this economic crisis the Tories have created? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is yes, astonishing that the Honourable Lady would say that all of our problems are solely down to Brexit. We have record energy bills. In the last year as a country, we've had to find an additional £150 billion as a country to fund energy because of the invasion of an independent sovereign country by Russia. That was not our fault, nor was the pandemic our fault. Where we put it, and she talks, the Honourable Lady talks about austerity, £400 billion of support in the pandemic, almost £100 billion of cost of living support and help with energy bills. That's not austerity. I'll tell you what that is. It's the United Kingdom Treasury backing every single part of the United Kingdom. John Warren. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Wages in the North East are 3% lower than when Labour left office. Households have lost £11,000 per year because of lost wage growth 
under the Conservatives. And now we, the IMF forecast we are going to get poorer still, with prices rising and the economy contracting because the Conservatives crashed the economy. Can I ask the Minister if he came into politics to make people poorer? And if not, isn't it a time for a Labour government to deliver the British people prosperity? Right. I'm not sure if the Honourable Lady was there for my maiden speech. I entirely uh, recognise she may not have been. I actually said in it that I'm a one nation Conservative because I believe in not going back to the dark and divisive days of high unemployment. That's exactly what I said. And here we are with the lowest unemployment in almost 50 years. But on the specific point of regional earnings, I can confirm that pay has grown in every region faster than London, outside London, since 2010. It shows we are succeeding on our levelling up agenda. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The IMF Chief, Chief Economist highlighted rising mortgage costs as a central issue facing the UK economy. I've heard from countless constituents fearful of losing their homes when their fixed rates come to an end and others whose dreams of getting on the property ladder has been snatched away. So what guarantees can the Minister provide that interest rates will get back to the levels seen before the disastrous mini-budget? Yes. Well, the Honourable Lady is experienced uh, colleague. She is well aware that we have an independent Bank of England. Interest rates are their responsibility. But the crucial thing is we need to work in partnership with them. And the way we do that is by ensuring that fiscal policy does everything possible to support a stable framework in which inflation is falling. That's why we've set a target for inflation to halve. And if we do that, obviously, interest rates will be lower than they otherwise would have been. Ruth Jones. Thank you, Mr. The news from the IMF this morning is deeply concerning. Small businesses are at the heart of the local economy in my constituency of Newport West. So why does the Minister think that the Federation of Small Businesses is reporting that small businesses' confidence is at its third lowest level since they started tracking it? Well, I'm grateful, I mean, she's, she's right to mention small businesses. They make such an important contribution to our economy. And my message to small businesses, um, we've put in enormous amount of support to help them with energy costs. Um, the £18 billion energy bill release scheme over the last six months, and we're continuing to support them uh, from April onwards. But of course, the best way to support them is providing a stable platform for growth, and that means inflation under control. It is the great challenge we face, and that's why, as the Chancellor said on Friday, the greatest tax cut we can provide is to reduce inflation, and that is what we are committed to. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the UK's economic decline, uh, started by Brexit but exacerbated by the mini budget, is genuinely sad and it hurts millions of ordinary, blameless people. In Northern Ireland at the moment, we have some protection with the protocol, which, while imperfect, has economic benefits, including dual market access, which has the potential to really transform our traditionally sluggish economy. Many businesses are already benef benefiting from this, and more investment will follow if the UK government will commit uh, to supporting the protocol. And if that is accompanied by responsible, devolved government focusing on skills and infrastructure. Will the Minister commit to advocating in Cabinet uh, for a pragmatic EU-UK deal? And if not, will he acknowledge that if the protection of the protocol is removed, more and more people in the centre ground in Northern Ireland will ask, when can we leave this Brexit madness through an agreed, dynamic, inclusive New Ireland? Minister. Well, of course, um, the Honourable Lady knows the work that's happening um, across government in respect of the protocol, but she talks about our economic decline. I, mean, I just want to be absolutely clear since 2010, the UK has grown faster than France, Japan, and Italy. She knows, as I've said earlier, there are 14 countries in the EU with higher inflation than we face at the moment. These are global challenges that we face. But we have the strength to get through it. And let me just give one example. As the, as the Chancellor pointed out on Friday, there are only three economies in the world with a £1 trillion tech sector. Tech is a huge part of our future economic growth. One of those countries is China. One of them is the United States. The other one, I'm pleased to say, is the United Kingdom. Patrick Grady. There is a popular cafe not far from here on Regency Street, and they have a sign in the window this morning that says, Breakfast only today. Sorry, we are badly understaffed. Now, that seems to chime with the findings of UK in a changing Europe that there is a 300,000 shortfall of workers as a result of Brexit and the end of freedom of movement. It seems that Brexit really does mean breakfast after all. So, will the government not admit uh, that it is Brexit that has taken the UK economy out of the frying pan and into the fire? 
Well, of course, uh, I, I don't know the specific circumstances why the cafe he refers to uh, is, is struggling to recruit. I have uh, no specific knowledge of it. I'm sure it offers a wonderful breakfast when it is able to, uh, Mr Speaker. What I can say, talking in aggregate, as is our servant, is that we are proud to have almost the lowest unemployment for the best part of 50 years. Of course, that does present challenges when you have a tight labour market. Um, that's why, Mr Speaker, we think the best way forward is to ensure we have the apprenticeships, the skills, the training to ensure that we can deliver the workforce to meet our growth ambitions. Alan Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. He keeps continuing the Tory playbook of excuses, global headwinds, global challenges, other countries of high inflation, Putin's illegal war and the pandemic. But yet the reality is the UK is the only G7 country facing a recession this year. So is that due to Tory incompetence or is it the Brexit dividend? Yeah, yeah. I was very clear about the challenges this year in respect of inflation, which is why we need to have fiscal discipline, something which I don't think the SNP has the slightest understanding of, because I only ever hear them ask for more spending, more tax cuts, all unfunded, while meanwhile their fundamental policy is, were they to be independent, is to have a currency without a, last, a lender of last resort, a quite extraordinary proposition for economic instability. So we take no lectures from them. We have done everything possible to support people in every part of the United Kingdom, including Scotland. Hi. Jonathan Edwards. Oh, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I do not suspect there is much hope of significantly, significantly boosting overall productivity unless we deal with the huge geographical wealth imbalances we have within the UK. What consideration, therefore, is being given to using the so-called Brexit freedoms? And in the case of Wales, this could involve devolving VAT and corporation tax to empower the Welsh Government to get on with the job of boosting the Welsh economy. And if these powers, uh, the so-called Brexit freedoms, are to be used, isn't the Welsh economy far better off back in the European single market and the customs union? Well, he knows uh, there is enormous benefit to Wales from being part of the United Kingdom. Um, I've set out the many ways that we are boosting this country, and of course, I gave the example of the changes to Solvency II regulations, which will hopefully see a significant increase in infrastructure investment. That will be a massive benefit to every part of the United Kingdom, including to Wales. Yeah. Speaker, often during economic slowdown, retail and hospitality sectors are hit the hardest, particularly for companies trading in non essential goods and services. What specific support is being considered? for such businesses to ensure that redundancies are minimised and jobs are protected? I have to say to lady, she makes a very good substantive economic point, which is when inflationary pressures are, excel are uh, higher, uh, as they are at the moment, it is discretionary consumption which comes under pressure, and that means, for example, demand in pubs and shops and so on. So all I can confirm we have taken huge steps to support hospitality, as we did in the pandemic. Um, we recently announced that the 50 per cent reduction in the business rates would be extended by another year and up to 75 per cent. I announced in December a six-month extension to the freeze in alcohol duty, but of course it's a really important sector, creating many jobs, and we want to see what more we can do to support it. To complete the urgent question, Jim Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister uh, for his answers to the urgent question? Uh, be being the only G7 company, according to the forecast, to have an economy set to shrink in this year, will the Minister consider increasing spending power in the United Kingdom by focusing on help for SMEs, which are the the backbone for our economy and the job creators, and particularly for businesses in Northern Ireland, which are hit harder by the costs associated with the reprehensible Northern Ireland <coughs> Protocol. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as ever, you saved the best for last. The Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right to continue being a stalwart champion of SMEs and small businesses in his constituency and indeed in Northern Ireland. That is why we are focused on growth in the whole of the United Kingdom, but underpinning that has to be fiscal stability and ultimately inflation falling. That is why the Prime Minister set the target to halve inflation. To get that down would be the best thing for consumers, it would be uh, the best thing for small businesses and it would be the best thing for our whole country. Right. That completes the urgent question. We are now going to come to presentation of bills. Barry Sherman. <coughs> Minister. Seatbelts penalty, penalty points bill. Second reading, what day? Friday, the 24th of March, Mr. Speaker. Friday, the 24th of March. Thank you. <laughs> right. We now come to the 10 minute rule bill. Go around, Davis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, beg to 
been moved to be given leave to bring in a bill, the Clean Air Bill, as set out on the order paper in, de in detail. Um, I first moved a uh, Clean Air Bill, in fact, on the 1st of November 2016, to coincide with the 60th anniversary of the Clean Air Act. And since then, obviously, I've been the chair of the All Party Group, and so it's pleased to present this bill 70 years on from the great London smog that incited that bill. And this is hot on the heels, of course, of another Clean Air Bill, the Clean Air Human Rights Bill, that I wholly support because, obviously, we should have a right to life, we should have a right to healthy environment and a right to clean air as set out for the United Nations. Um, I'm very pleased that today we have in our presence Rosamond Adu Kissimmee uh, Deborah, um, who uh, and it has pioneered um, clean air, and this month, uh, tragically, is the 10th anniversary of the death of her daughter, Ella, who was the first person to have uh, air pollution as a cause of death on the, on, the, on the death certificate. And the coroner there said it was crucial that we did uh, enforce World Health Organization air quality standards and have a greater awareness uh, of the public health risks amongst GPs and the public. And these provisions need to be in any uh, Clean Air Bill or Act uh, as Ella's law. Um, globally, we've got a situation where some nine million people are dying prematurely of uh, dirty air. In Britain, the figure is around 64,000 at a cost of 24 billion to the economy, to the NHS, and particularly through productivity loss. And, and what we're looking at here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is um, lung cancer, heart disease, strokes, diabetes, of, um, obesity, uh, babies and children and all people being affected in their physical and mental health uh, through their lives. These are avoidable risks. Uh, we had a situation where The Lancet is saying that 41 of 52 cities uh, breached the World Health Organization 2014 uh, standards of 10 micrograms per cubic uh, metre for PM2.5. Uh, this is unacceptable. We've got a situation where pollution uh, provokes allergies. There's something like 21 million people in Britain with allergies. Uh, we're in the top three nations in the world for allergies. We've got 5.4 million people with asthma. We know that air pollution it provokes childhood asthma and sometimes tragically death. We know that uh, with COVID, according to Harvard and the Max Planck Institute, the death rate uh, in uh, more polluted areas is 8 to 12 per cent uh, higher than otherwise. And, and this is particularly the case in the sort of poorer, more diverse and polluted areas, which account to a great deal why we saw such discrepancies in different groups in death rates and infection rates during the pandemic. These were avoidable. Um, the focus naturally has tended to be uh, on outdoor air pollution, the so-called natural environment that the Environment Act dealt with, talking about transport industry, agriculture, etc., uh, forgetting that we spend 90% of our time indoors and something like 900 dangerous chemicals have been found indoors that impact on people's health. They, these vary range from building materials in volatile um, organic compounds, cleaning agents, flame retardants, cooking, of course, and mould and damp generate asthma. Uh, candles, of course, uh, are very unhealthy as well. And so we've got a situation of a cocktail of of poisonous chemicals indoors, then, then mixing up with what's outdoors to provide major problems. We've seen some reduction in uh, nitrogen oxides, but uh, ironically, this will generate more ozone, which will generate more indoor air pollution. We've also got this growth of wood burners, something like one and a half million people have got these wood burners, often sort of uh, middle class people in urban environments who've got central heating, who are polluting themselves and their communities, because wood burners are actually six times worse than HGVs for generating particulates. And the government needs to be brave on this and take action in terms of restricting the use and sale of wood burners. 
Um, the government's ambitions are, frankly, uh, hopeless in relation to the EU in terms of our targets. The government said, oh, we will achieve 10 micrograms of PM2.5 by 2040, uh, while the EU is saying they'll achieve that target by 2030, 10 years earlier, and that will mean thousands of unnecessary deaths in Britain. And this 10 micrograms is, isn't anywhere near to the WHO current guidelines, World Health Organization current guidelines, of 5 micrograms. We know that the report uh, commissioned by the Chief, Medical of uh, Chief Scientific Officer, Sir Patrick Valance, into indoor uh, air pollution has found that we need better ventilation, better filtration, better indoor air quality uh, to ensure that um, we can save, in, in their estimation, 1.3 trillion pounds over the next 60 years and indeed the chief medical officer Chris Whitty has also done a report uh, to, to highlight the fact that there's much greater infection from poorly ventilated uh, environments and uh, recommendations to improve that in terms of the work, home and transport infrastructure as well as his focus on wood burners. We need greater awareness um, uh, so that people who send their children to school know they're, they're being polluted in the school and in the playgrounds to generate polit political uh, pressure on local authorities, MPs and other representatives to actually campaign for change. Um, we need a holistic view. Uh, it's, no, it's all very well deaf for having some targets and the, health, the NHS picking up increasing numbers of people with all sorts of conditions, uh, including dementia and, and lungs and brains and hearts, as I've mentioned. Uh, we need, obviously, the transport uh, team uh, involved in this. We need a fiscal strategy from the Treasury to deliver. So we need a, 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 sort of so, a, a, a holistic approach that brings together all the departments in a way that takes this seriously. We, we talk the talk on net zero, of course, uh, but the truth is that both air pollution and net zero are generated by one thing, which is burning fossil fuels. So pollution and reducing air pollution should be seen as a driver for delivering net zero rather than a helpful byproduct. but that's not how it's seen. Uh, we can have uh, new innovation where, for example, we might generate um, uh, hydrogen from uh, off-peak renewables and feed that, for instance, in the gas grid, so when you boil your egg, there's a, both less a carbon footprint, but also the toxicity of what you're breathing is much less, uh, in particular if you don't uh, ventilate. We need proper enforcement. Uh, under the EU, obviously, Client Earth was able to take the government to court and get fines implemented. We need those teeth in the Environment Protection, the Office for Environment Protection, which it currently hasn't got. The government's first duty uh, should be to protect its citizens, citizens of the right to clean air and health. And I know uh, that my colleagues uh, will be bringing in, with a Labour government, a Clean Air Act. In the meantime, uh, it is imperative that we all do everything we can now to save as many lives as possible uh, for Ella, for all our children, uh, and for all our tomorrows. Thank you very much. Yeah. Questions that the Honourable Gentleman have leave to bring in his bill. As many of that opinions say aye. 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 Contrary, no. I think the ayes just about have it. <laughs> Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Uh, John McNally, Leila Moran, Ben Lake, Rosie Duffield, Ian Byrne, Debbie Abrahams, Dawn Butler, Brenda Sharma, Dan Jarvis, <coughs> Caroline Lucas, and Christine Jardine, and myself, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Geraint Davis. Clean Air Bill. Second reading, what day? Friday, 24th of March. Friday, the 24th of March. We now come to the first opposition motion on crime and neighbourhood policing. <coughs> Mr. Speaker has selected Amendment A, tabled in the name of the Prime Minister. 
Yvette Cooper to move the motion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I beg to move the motion in my name and that of the Leader of the Opposition. The motion is to restore and renew neighbourhood <coughs> policing that has been decimated by 13 years of Conservative government. But before I talk about what's happening in our towns on policing and crime, can I just first briefly say something about the publication today of the police response to the Hillsborough inquiry. 97 people lost their lives as a result of what happened at Hillsborough 34 years ago, and families had to fight through decades against smears, lies and obfuscation to get the truth. But they still don't have justice 34 years on. So the fulsome apology from the police today is welcome, and so too is their acceptance of some of the Bishop's recommendations about a duty of candour, something the government has previously voted against, yeah, yeah, yeah. as well as support for families at inquests. Yeah, yeah. But this is already five years after the Bishop's report, and it's already 34 years after Hillsborough. So where is the government's response? They promised nearly 18 months ago we would have a response by the end of 2021, but the months and the years keep rolling by. We need a commitment to a Hillsborough law yeah, to yeah, address yeah. this. And I just say to the Home Secretary, her predecessor but four, the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, <laughs> did take this seriously, yeah. and we welcomed yeah. that. Yeah. But it shows a lack of respect to the families who have endured so much and the communities who have support for, supported them and fought for them to have no response right now. And I would ask the Home Secretary, I will happily give way to her if she wants to tell us when that government response to the Hillsborough report will be published. I'll address my response to her afterwards. Thank her and look forward to her response because she will know how important that is. Let me turn to neighbourhood policing. The number of people who say they never see the police on patrol on the streets has almost doubled since the Conservatives took office, from around a quarter of the population to half the population, half the country, saying they never or hardly ever see a police officer patrolling the streets. That's from the National Crime Survey. That is what 13 years of the Conservatives have done. At the same time, the number of criminals being caught or punished has plummeted. Since 2010, arrests have halved, prosecutions almost halved, community penalties halved, crimes <coughs> solved halved. The proportion of cases that collapse because victims are giving up and dropping out has trebled. More crimes are being reported and recorded, but hundreds of thousands fewer crimes are being solved. Hundreds of thousands fewer victims are getting justice and more criminals are getting away with it. Yeah. And every one of us will have the cases in our surgeries, the residents who have complained about the drug dealers on the corner and nothing yeah. is done, the street drinkers who make them feel unsafe and nothing is done, the broken windows, the shop break-ins that just go ignored, the antisocial behaviour that escalates, the kids who've been expelled from school who just wander the streets, getting drawn into gang violence instead and nothing is done the repeat offender back out of prison, who no one is following up, and the domestic abuse victim, who has no one to turn to because the police are so overstretched, the court delays are so long, and more victims are just giving up on the whole thing and walking away. I, I will give way, I will give way in turn. I'll give way to the Honourable Member first. I'm very grateful to the Right Honourable Lady, and, and I understand that her uh, mission today and her job is to paint a, a sort of dystopian picture of, of crime. But before she elaborates on that, uh, would she like to take this opportunity to congratulate the police on the very significant falls that we've seen, not just in specific crimes like burglary and robbery and knife crime, but also in overall crime? She will know that the Crime Survey in England and Wales published just uh, recently that showed the year to September showed overall crime now down. 10% on pre-pandemic levels. Surely that's something she wants to congratulate the police for before she enumerates their sometimes obvious but nevertheless uh, difficult failings. It's your failing. Yeah, it's so it's not let me be very clear. I welcome the huge amount of work that police officers do every yeah. single day of the week yeah. to keep our communities safe. 
the police officers and the PCSOs who are overstretched, the detectives who are juggling huge caseloads that they really struggle to keep up with because there are huge shortages of detectives, because there's been no workforce planning by the government for year after year after year. And we know, I welcome too, some of the trends, the long-term trends in crime that started 25 years ago, but I would just say the government's motion today just rules out, eliminates online crime, despite that is the kind of crime that has soared over the last few years that have, where we have seen some of the big increases. And whilst government ministers may want to dismiss the huge frauds against pensioners who have lost their savings, the online scams or the, the grooming of children online, I think that we should take those sorts of online crimes, I think we should take fraud immensely seriously because it is devastating and ruins people's lives. Uh, I will just give way to the honourable member, then I will come away to my honourable friend. I'm extremely grateful for giving way. She's making a powerful speech. And I would wholeheartedly agree with her with what she is saying about un investigated non-violent crime in particular causing people to lose hope and I keep hearing of people who don't bother reporting crime at all anymore um, but may I ask her to elaborate as she's already started to do on online crime and in particular on ID theft which see uh, I've got a constituent of mine who's recently had her ID stolen uh, it has caused thousands of pounds of uh, consternation to her and her family uh, the police want to investigate but they just don't have the resources would you mind elaborating on Lady Spans yeah. Well, the Honourable Member is, is completely right, and we've seen growing changing patterns of crime with changing technology as criminals make the most of changes in new technology, and the problem is the police have not been equipped to keep up. Yeah. And that ultimately is the responsibility of the government. Yeah. And so it's no use government ministers or conservative backbenchers blaming the police for the situation that the Home Office has put our police forces in and the way in which they have not been able to keep up with changing crime and the changing pressures upon them as well. I give away to my honourable friend. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. And, uh, you know, we know that the crime varies across the country, but she'll share my horror that knife crime in North East England has increased by 104 per cent from 1,077 incidents in 2015 to 2,203 last year. That's hundreds more lives impacted by the government's failure to get on top of the serious crime in our region. We've had some so called extra money in Cleveland, but still have hundreds of fewer police officers in, than in 2010. Does she agree there's a long term sustainable plan? Order. I really do have to explain to colleagues that um, there are a lot of people who want to take part in this debate. Using an intervention to make a speech when you're not on the speaker's list is frankly not in order. Yvette Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, my honourable friend is, is right that the, uh, what's happened on serious violent crime is obviously some of the most troubling, where we have had since, I think, 2015, a huge increase in uh, serious knife crime and violence and where we have seen some of the, the, the criminal gangs change their model to be able to groom more children, to draw young people into crime and into violence as a result. And it is our young people who we are seeing paying the price for the way in which the criminal gangs have been operating. That is why we put forward a proposal to change the law, to strengthen the law, to outlaw child criminal exploitation, to make it easier to crack down on criminal gangs. And I would urge government ministers who have voted against that proposal to accept that proposal and to take a much tougher line on the criminal gangs that are exploiting our children. And the problem is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that from policing to courts to our NHS to social care to our trains to our economy, after 13 years of the Tories, it just feels like nothing in Britain is working anymore. That is the damage that they have done. I will give way to them. I'm very grateful to her. And Welsh Labour Government's Commission on Justice in Wales recommended that policing and crime policy be devolved to Wales to be aligned with, with social and health policy. Yet there are some on the Labour, um, among Labour MPs who uh, resist this, um, even though it is Mark Drakeford's policy, and that policing is, of course, devolved to Scotland, to Northern Ireland, and even to Manchester. Could she tell me whether it is ever likely that a Labour government or Labour in Westminster would recommend devolution of policing to Wales? 
Well, the, the Welsh Government already does take a different approach in a way that I think is significant because they have worked with police and crime commissioners in Wales, the Welsh Government has worked, to support and fund yep. additional police yep. Yep. Uh, PCSOs. And that does make a difference and has made a difference in terms of the neighbourhood policing uh, on Welsh streets. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Government has put down an amendment to our motion today so that they can vote against Labour's plan to increase neighbourhood policing. And that is what honourable members opposite are voting for tonight. They are voting against Labour's plans to increase neighbourhood policing. Yeah. Yeah. Instead, they want us to welcome, they want us to welcome their efforts to increase police numbers. But who cut them in the first place? It was Tory MPs and Tory ministers who voted to cut 20,000 police officers from forces right across the country, from our neighbourhoods, from detective work, from response teams. And now they expect everyone to be grateful because they're trying to put some of them back. 20,000 experienced police officers gone. And they claim that they're on track to reverse the cuts. Well, actually, they aren't, because the number of officers leaving policing has been increasing. Because forces like North Yorkshire have said today they're leaving 120 vacancies unfilled so that they can make their budget add up. And the police aren't ending up on the streets either, because more of them are now behind desks, because police staff have been cut and bureaucracy has gone up and because more of them are dealing with mental health crises and missing persons, because after 13 years of Tory government, the NHS and social care can't cope, and the police are having to pick Absolutely. up the pieces. Because there's a, a huge shortage of detectives, because there's been no national workforce plan, and everyone is having to try and plug the gaps. And there are 6,000 fewer neighbourhood officers and 8,000 fewer PCSOs, with the number of PCSOs having halved since 2010. So neighbourhood teams have been decimated, and that is why people say they don't see the police on the street anymore, because across the country they aren't on the street anymore. No wonder it feels like Britain isn't working communities are being let down. Yeah, yeah, I give way yeah. to my friend. Oh. I'm very grateful to the Shadow Home Secretary for giving way. She's making an excellent speech. There's been 3,500 less PCOs now than in 2010, but it's not just the numbers. She talked about people behind desks. The estate is vanishing as well. In Ealing, we used to have Greenford, Hanwell, Ealing, Acton, four police stations. Now there's only one left. Police need places to do their paperwork as well. Would she agree with me? The, the honourable friend makes a really important point, and right across the country, over the last 13 years, the police forces have closed police stations. Some of them are now HMOs with problems with antisocial yeah. behaviour instead. You could not make it up as a result of decisions that Conservative ministers have made. But look, it's good to see the Home Secretary here today, because we don't see her that much. And if I'm honest, I don't really know what she does. Because the DLUC secretary, the DLUC secretary has been put in charge of doing antisocial behaviour. The Prime Minister has taken charge on small boats. The Navy's been in charge of patrolling the Channel. The, no, it didn't work, did it? No. The <laughs> DLUC secretary, in fact, that much vaunted policy that they announced a year ago has ended up with actually record high levels of dangerous boat crossings. The DLUC secretary is also deciding on the prevent review and running homes for Ukraine, while the education secretary, the work and pension secretary and the treasury have taken over deciding legal migration policy and have cancelled the home secretary's plan to bring back the net migration target or cut student numbers. The Immigration Minister has taken over asylum accommodation because when the Home Secretary was in charge, she broke the law. The Security Minister has taken over security policy because she can't be trusted not to leak. She's not cr charging criminals because that has got worse. In fact, the number of prosecutions fell by 20 per cent when the Home Secretary was the Attorney General. She's not 
sorting out the Windrush scandal because she's cancelled all of that. She's not doing work on police standards, tackling misogyny or racism or violence against women and girls because she thinks all of that is woke. All of that fuss about the sacking this week of the member for Stratford as the Tory party chair and minister without portfolio, the real minister without portfolio, is still in office. Though she doesn't get let out much, she doesn't even do TV or radio interviews. So I don't think we've heard her in the morning for months or on a Sunday for months because she is the shadow of a Home Secretary. She is a shadow, shadow Home Secretary. So why doesn't she just get out of the way and let somebody else do the job? But Mr Deputy Speaker, the absentee Tory Home Secretary isn't new. Successive Tory Home Secretaries have walked away from action to get justice for victims, to catch criminals or keep communities safe. So, Knife crime is 71% higher than it was seven years ago. Stabbings are up 63%. Knife-enabled rape is at a record high. Will my, will my honourable friend give way on that? I will give way. I'm grateful to her for giving way. The charge rate for rape is 1.6%, just 1.6%. Yeah. And does she agree, therefore, with me that it is down to the large-scale cuts to policing and the CPS budget that conviction rates are so low and the overwhelming majority of victims are not getting the justice they deserve. 13 years from this government, what they're doing is allowing rapists yeah. to go scot-free yeah. yeah. while yeah. victims yeah. suffer. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. 100%. Well, my um, honourable friend makes a really important point yeah. because the truth is that more criminals are getting off mm -hmm. under the Tories as a result of the last 13 years yeah. of Conservative government. Yeah. Criminals are not paying the price. So around 7,000 people will be the victim of theft today. Just over 4,000 of those thefts will be reported to the police. Only 180 of them will face court. So for thousands more victims, there will be no justice at all. And the worst figures of all are on rape. And it's worth having a look at the Conservatives' motion today because it shows how low they've fallen and how out of touch they are. Yeah. The truth is that the proportion of rape cases reaching charge is still two-thirds lower than it was six or seven years ago, and it was too low then. But this motion is effectively boasting about an increase of a third in the number of adult rape convictions in the last year. The number of convictions they're talking about in the course of a year is 532. Mm -hmm. It is the equivalent of around one and a half convictions a day. So it may be perhaps up from just over one conviction a day the year before during the COVID crisis. And now think how many women are raped every day. An estimated 300. So we are supposed to be grateful and applaud the fact that in maybe one and a half of those cases, rather than one of those cases, there might be a conviction. What kind of justice does it provide to the other 298 or 290 women that just one or two of those rapists were locked up? And what kind of shameless failing government thinks it should boast about that appalling failure in justice for women and girls? And I would say to members opposite today, that is the motion you will be voting for this afternoon. Thank voting you. against an increase in neighbourhood police and voting to boast about a truly dismal record in tackling violence against women and girls. I will give way. Thank you, Your Honourable, Honourable Friend, for giving away. Despite the unprecedented levels of recorded rape and sexual offences, local authorities and charities are ha having to fight to keep victim support services, such as women centres, open. Meanwhile, the long-promised victim bill is nowhere to be seen. So, does my right honourable friend agree that, alongside ending violence against women and girls, we must also prioritise supporting the victims of crime? 
My honourable friend is absolutely right. Where is the Victims' Bill? Where is the opportunity to provide proper support for victims of crime, not just for victims of domestic abuse and sexual violence, but victims more widely, victims across the board who need the support and too often have had the government turn its back on them and too often have been so badly let down? Where too is the action to get specialist rape investigation units in all of our police forces? Again, too often the government has turned its back. And as for all of their talk about powers or sentencing, the reality is they voted against Labour's policy for new powers to clamp down on the criminal gangs that are exploiting and grooming children. They voted against Labour's policy to increase sentences for rape and set minimum sentences. They voted against Labour's policy for increased monitoring and powers on domestic abuse repeat perpetrators. They voted to cut... Oh, I will, if I will give way to the honourable member, if he can defend his government's decision not to make uh, specialist rape investigation not to make specialist rape investigations units mandatory and also not to vote for our minimum sentences in rape cases. Well, she asked about sentencing in rape cases. I'd like to point out firstly that the average rape sentence now is nearly two years higher than it was after the last Labour government. And she talks about voting on rape sentencing during the passage of the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill uh, last year or the year before. Extraordinarily, in committee, Labour voted against a specific clause in the bill that saw rape, people convicted of rape spending two-thirds of their sentence in prison rather than one-third. Yes, they did. I was extremely surprised. So perhaps the Shadow Home Secretary can explain to the House why Labour voted against keeping rapists in prison for longer. They did. You did. Well, Mr Speaker, the, the Labour Party voted for minimum sentences for rape. We voted to increase sentencing for rape. But I would just say, actually, it doesn't matter what the sentencing powers are if nobody is being prosecuted and nobody is being sentenced in the first place. And the numbers of people who are being prosecuted and sentenced has plummeted. Victims are not getting justice. Record numbers of victims are ending up giving up on the criminal justice system because they have been so badly let down after 13 years of a Conservative yeah. government. How can a prosecution rate of 1.6 per cent be anything other than a total shame, a total dereliction of duty by this Conservative government, Conservative Home Office and Conservative ministers? And remember too, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Conservatives also voted to cut Labour's counter-terror powers ending control orders so that the TPIMs that replaced them are now barely used. They voted to cut Labour's antisocial behaviour powers, so what's left yeah. is barely used at all. Yeah. We do hear now that they want to do something more on antisocial behaviour. They are fed up with nuisance neighbours holding loud parties or risky behaviour in the streets or on the car in our cars, and they are thinking about bringing in more fixed penalty notices. Well, the Prime Minister certainly knows all about that one. The first ever Prime Minister to ratchet up not just one, but two penalties for law-breaking in the space of 12 months, surrounded round the Cabinet table by multiple rule-breakers and other repeat offenders who chose to ignore warnings about rule-breaking by a record four of his Cabinet ministers that he appointed and who's chosen to appoint as his Home Secretary and his Justice Secretary the two jobs most responsible for establishing respect for the rules, enforcement of the law, two people who he was warned in the autumn were both under suspicion for breaking Minister's own rules. I give away to the Honourable Member. Mr Deputy Speaker. Anna Firth. Oh, Mr Deputy Speaker, would you ask the Shadow Home Secretary to explain what this has got to do, please, with the matter that we are debating this afternoon? If I believed that the Honourable Lady was out of order, the Right Honourable Lady was out of order, I would have said so. Yeah. Yvette Cooper. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have to say to the Honourable Member that um, if she doesn't see any connection between 
establishing respect in our communities, respect for the rule of law, respect for the rules, a sense of enforcement, and the behaviour of government ministers on the fixed penalty notices, the law breaking by the Prime Minister himself, then what she's doing is reflecting that same problem of this culture across the Conservative Party that it is just one rule for them and another for everyone else. No wonder no one takes them seriously on law and order anymore. I said I would decide when the line has been crossed. The Honourable, Right Honourable Lady is in grave danger of crossing the line. Yvette Cooper. With respect always for the rules as well as for the rule of law. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we need, Mr Deputy Speaker, we need a new approach, because this isn't fair on our communities. The collapse in labourhood policing, the collapse in justice for victims, isn't just making people feel less safe, it's also undermining our town centres and our local economies. And it's undermining respect for the rule of law and trust, the crucial vital trust that lies at the heart of the British policing model of policing by consent. <coughs> talking about respect and we're also talking about trust and I think we have to acknowledge that trust in the police has been significantly eroded of late. Um, does she agree with me that neighbourhood policing is actually critical to rebuilding that trust and much better to see a police officer in this, on the street who knows their local yeah. community yeah, yeah, yeah. and is known by them as opposed to a distance passing and a response yeah, yeah, yeah. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, the Honourable Member is exactly right because it's having those police officers and PCSOs rooted in communities who know communities but who can also respond to communities and to community concerns. It helps because they gather the intelligence about offenders and about perpetrators. It also helps prevent crime in the first place, helps build trust so that people feel more confident about reporting to the police. And I agree with her that it is crucial, alongside the other reforms I was just about to refer to, that we would also introduce a new law on police standards, making vetting compulsory, being clear on mandatory standards on training and misconduct, because with a very basic idea that, frankly, if a police officer faces allegations of rape or domestic abuse, they should be suspended not just put behind a desk. Raising standards and increasing the community connections of the police is a really important way to support policing as well as support communities. I'll give way to them now. Shadow Minister for our, uh, our, our discussion and what you've put forward today. I very much support the issue of community policing. Uh, just Monday past, yesterday, we had a meeting with the Chief Inspector back in Northern Ireland to do with the cutbacks in police. One thing that he told us was community policing will be central to any policing going forward. Now, that's what we're doing in Northern Ireland. Does the Honourable Lady agree that should be what should happen here? Well, I do agree it is what should happen here, and at the moment it's not happening. At the moment we still have 6,000 fewer police officers, 8,000 fewer PCSOs, and with rumours that PCSOs may face further cuts over the next 12 months, just at a time when we should be supporting and working with communities instead of fear that actually things may be going further backwards. That is why Labour has set out plans for 13,000 additional police officers and PCSOs, funded by requiring forces to sign up for joint procurement and ring-fencing of some of the new recruits to go alongside the new law on police standards. The police across the country, there are police officers doing some phenomenal work. Those remaining police officers who are based in our communities and the PCSOs who work very hard every single day of the week, the officers who are attempting to solve crimes with huge caseloads and facing real pressure and trouble. But those officers need our support and they need the additional neighbourhood policing teams in place to rebuild those connections. I give way to the Honourable Member. Well, I give away. I mean, clearly increased numbers is very Important, but would the um, right honourable lady agree with me that in addition to that, we need to give the police officers the power they need to take a zero tolerance approach to being where we need to robust in tackling people who make who blight our town centres and make life misery for so many. So I do agree that the police do need to have the powers to tackle uh, serious abuse, antisocial behaviour, problems in our town centres. At the moment, there aren't police officers there. Too often, they aren't on patrol and they aren't there. And I would just gently remind him, it was his government, it was the Conservative MPs who all voted to cut 
anti-social behaviour powers and leaving people with, with powers that just aren't being used at all. Nobody's using the anti-social powers that they've even got, and it was ministers opposite and MPs, Tory MPs opposite, who voted to cut those powers in the first place. So we have to rebuild... I'm very, I'm very grateful to my right.